So at the end, I hope you're thinking about education and perhaps how it could be a little bit more ambitious. But at the start, I'd like to start with a catastrophe. I think probably the most famous of the Apollo missions to the moon is Apollo 11, you know, Neil Armstrong, one small step for mankind, that sort of thing. But the mission that I find most amazing is Apollo 13. Within a day or two of launch, they'd move to an unsafe orbit, a non-return orbit. If something went wrong, they wouldn't come back to Earth when they returned around the moon. And something did go wrong, terribly wrong. They had an explosion. They lost their oxygen for breathing, but also for fuel. They lost their ability to generate most power. And they needed the power for heating, for light, for comms, for computer, for navigation. I often wonder how they must have felt as they passed the moon. They were furthest away from the rest of humanity than we'd ever been, more apart than anyone had ever been before. How did they feel when all the things they'd rehearsed, all their planning, all their checklists became useless because of this unexpected catastrophe? And that's my job. I teach cybersecurity students how to deal with the unexpected. Now, it's not what I expected to do. I didn't think teaching would be like that. I thought I'd be teaching computer science students programming languages, about binary numbers, information about computers, maybe a checklist of the things you can do to defend a website against a hacker. But here we are trying to teach them what? Think for a moment, who was your best teacher, your best class, your favorite learning experience you had at school, the one you carried with you that you cherish the most. I've been asking that question to students for more than 20 years as part of my research. And most of the answers tend to be the same. Students really cherish the times that their education changed them and it changed the way they thought. It's funny. As you get older, you tend to forget that. And it can be tempting to think of education as just a form of job training, perhaps the skills and checklists you need when you start in a new career. But education can be much more than that. That sort of stuff is actually best learnt on the job. What I cherished most about my own education wasn't what my out-of-date professors thought about what the workforce was like. It was the ways they taught me to think. So how do I want my students to think? What thinking skills do I want them to have to be good cybersecurity experts? Well, they need to be curious. They need to question everything. They need to be analytic. They need to be creative. They need to be lateral thinkers and they need to never give up. So how can I teach them that? I know how to teach them a checklist. Can we teach those skills? I've got 10 things I try, and I'll tell you some of them now. One, I lie to them. Humans are funny. We don't like changing what we believe. Once we believe something, we recruit our intellect to make us still believe that thing. You've probably heard of confirmation bias. If not, you should look it up. It's interesting, and it's a little bit frightening to realize it applies not just to the outside world, but it applies to you and to me. We use our brains to trick ourselves. And research shows the more education you've had, the harder it is to change your mind about something, even when it's demonstrably wrong. We use our minds against ourselves. I don't want my students to be confident, to be overly confident with what they know. I don't even want them to be confident with what I know. I want them to always be questioning. So I lie to them. I tell them I'm going to, and then I do it shamelessly and gleefully, I lie, lie, lie. They can't trust anything I say. Well, they can trust most of what I say, but which bits can they trust and which bits can't? The things I tell them that aren't correct, that no one picks up at the time, I put in the final exam. And I'm really pleased to notice that most students end up getting them right. Perhaps I've taught them critical thinking, or perhaps they just weren't listening. The second thing I think is important for them to know is making decisions, yes or no. Part of being an academic and a student is analysis, weighing things up and evaluating things, and that's good and essential. But there can be a problem 
we can think about things until we're paralyzed by indecision and not able to make a decision one way or the other. I need my students to be able to act in times of urgency and make a call. Even if it's wrong, it's better to make an informed call than to do nothing. We see that now with the coronavirus and our leaders around the world having to make decisions. It's not easy, but it's essential. So how do we do that? I give them case studies, put them in scenarios, real world scenarios where they analyze a problem that's actually happened and they have to make a decision. If I get it right, they're never sure their decision's right. They're not sure if they've got it right or wrong. And they keep thinking about it when they go home. Sometimes, years later, students come up to me and proudly tell me new solutions they've worked out, new things they could do for case studies I did with them years ago. I can't tell you how happy that makes me feel. Thirdly is teamwork. We're social animals. We need to work with others. It's funny. Western storytelling tradition tends to be about individual heroes, about single people bringing about things all by themselves. And our education system up until they come to uni certainly has reinforced that. They compete with each other, they get individual scores, they are disincentivized for collaborating. I need to turn that round because no real world engineering problems are ever solved by individuals. They're now too complex. We need teams to solve them. The astronauts in Apollo 13 did make it back. It's frankly unbelievable that they did. You should check it out. They only got back because of cooperation. The astronauts on the mission, the people at control back on Earth, and other scientists and experts around the planet worked together to bring them back. No single person could have done it. Cooperation. Thank you, Sesame Street. Last of all is keep them wanting more. Never satisfy them. It's a great storytelling technique, the, um, if you know it, which is you don't give the reader what they want. I try to inflame a curiosity in them, but not fully satisfy it. So they themselves are driven to go away and work it out themselves. I learned this from an Australian physicist, Professor Julian Sunder Miller, who used to be on TV when I was a child. He'd show it a crazy experiment, an egg being sucked into a milk bottle, and he'd turn to you and he'd say, why is it so? Why was it so? I needed to know. He would never tell us. I became a scientist that I suspect there's a whole generation that did because of him and he never ever told us. How do we use that technique in my teaching? I really wanna tell you that, but I'm out of time. So instead, let me tell you a story. This is a true story. I want to illustrate how we apply the ideas I'm talking about concretely in an actual teaching scenario. A Couple of years ago, we're teaching a summer class. The students turned up to the first lecture and couldn't get into the lecture theater. They knocked and banged on the doors but no one came to let them in. I turned up a little bit late and the students told me they'd seen someone inside that heard a loud bang, but they couldn't get their attention. I called security and eventually the security guard came. The person inside, I explained to the students, was probably Thurston, a well-known student that I'd employed to, be, um, to record the lectures. But the security guard said, no, that's not possible. There's no one inside because the burglar alarm's set and the door's locked and it hasn't been turned off since the start of the holidays a week ago. We went inside and he was right. There was no one in there. The Testin must have been in there because there was a tripod set up in the middle of the room with a video camera running and the tape had only been going for 10 minutes and the batteries were full and we'd seen him inside. What a mystery. That week I was teaching them deductive thinking and I asked them to work together to solve a real world problem to practice their deductive thinking. I suggested they could solve the problem of what was one of the tutor's middle names. Someone called out, where's Thurston? So we made that the problem instead, and they tried to solve it. After a week or two, they suddenly realized the problem was a real problem. Thurston had disappeared and no one had seen him again. It vanished from a locked room when people were standing outside. By the time they realized this was perhaps a bit deeper than they'd thought, already their memories had started to fade of what had happened and data and evidence had started being lost. They pulled together what they'd learned. Someone had found a, a, a bullet shell on the ground in the room next to three bent pins. A couple of other students had seen a sugar bowl, a weird sugar bowl, which was full of sugar. Someone had tested it. Um, there was a strange smell in the air that someone else had noticed, maybe sulfur or gunpowder. They were intrigued, but they were also mystified. I pretended I didn't know anything about it. The course went on. In the last week, one of the students stood up and said he'd like to do a little presentation. I said, sure. 
He said he wanted to tell how he and his friends had solved the mystery of the vanishing Thurston. A denouement. <laughs> the class and I sat entranced as he told us the story and how it had happened and what had happened. It involved, weirdly enough, one of the tutor's middle names, the main assignment they'd done, three bed pins, and a bullet case. You probably know me well enough now to realize I'm not gonna tell you what the solution was. And really, it wasn't important. What was important was the skills they had to use to solve it. They had to be skeptical, they had to be analytical, they had to work in a team, they had to be creative, and they had to deal with the unexpected. I guess, most importantly, they had to never give up. They solved it and they got it right, though now I think about it, I don't think I ever told them they were right. The motto of the Apollo 13 mission was Ex Luna Scientia, from the moon knowledge. They had to jettison most of their experiments when everything went wrong. But when they returned, they did still bring back great knowledge. Only it wasn't about the moon, it was about people and about thinking and about how to deal with the unexpected. Thank you.